actually going to hit you up with a bunch of data to begin with, and I apologize in advance for potentially overwhelming you with a number of charts and numbers, but hopefully it'll give you some context, which is really what I'm here to do about young adults, which we refer to as millennials. And the definition of millennials are people born after 1981. So in case you now find yourself in that category, congratulations. Um, and I, I actually want to, I don't know if any of you get the Thomas Cott, Cott You've Caught Mail. Does anybody get that newsletter? Um, I highly recommend it. Um, Thomas Cott is the director of marketing at the Alvin Ailey Dance Theater. And basically, on, on a regular basis, he sends out these, um, he basically scours um, online media and blogs and sends out these thematic emails. And this morning, he sent out something called about future proofing. I just wanted to give a definition and come back to that. But future proofing is the process by which efforts are made to ensure that products and information made, stored today, are relevant and accessible in the future. It's a lot about coding, but it's also relevant, especially to museums. But as we think about how to increase our longevity and our relevance to our audience and our community in the future, um, I'll just leave you with that idea as we go into this. But a little bit about Wolf Brown. Uh, we basically do a range of different things, um, research planning evaluations, specifically in the arts sector. I've worked with a number of different disciplines, as Jessica pointed out, as well as museums. Um, we do general populations of arts participation, impact assessment, everything from just counting who's in your audience to understanding how they make decisions about how to tend what drives motivations and um, capacity building. Basically, uh, I think um, your board president mentioned uh, actually you doing evaluation yourself, and certainly we all believe that everybody is a researcher in your own right. You don't actually need to hire Wolf Brown in order to gather information about your audiences and your constituents. So I want to start off with a little context, actually. And um, I took, um, there's this really great website that the Pew Foundation put together, and I have a link for it, actually, in my presentation later on. But essentially, it, it lays out what is the difference between millennials and their grandparents. Let's just put it that way. Um, and uh, why should we care? Well, uh, the projected population of the millennials, basically, they have exceeded the baby boomer generation now. They make up the largest generation within the overall US population, outweighing Generation X. As you can see, it's the top line over there. And the baby boomers, because they're aging and passing on, uh, you know, their populations are decreasing. That used to be the, the most populous generation in the United States. But, but the millennials are pretty, uh, a very, very strong, essentially, and are increasingly strong influence in our culture and the activities and the trends that take place. They're also more diverse. Uh, this is uh, evident, actually, in pretty much every audience uh, survey I've ever done, that the younger respondents uh, typically are more diverse than their older counterparts. It's just to note, again, there are different value systems that come along with the different backgrounds that everybody represents and how we interact with each other and where we come from and what is of value to us. So that's some context. Um, also, as we talk about, especially here, all the influx of tech workers, Millennials lead workforce numbers, right? They've gotten to the point where they actually now are all in the workforce. So they may be the um, lowest wage earners right now because they're at the beginning of the careers, but as they move up, right, the income potential increases and, um, and basically, hopefully at that point, right, there's more openness to giving or giving it larger amounts. And we'll hear actually from, I think, some of our other panel panelists around that. But I just wanted to give you, um, and this is actually the website, you'll have access to this uh, presentation, I believe, after this. And so this is the website where all of these charts are taken from, and there's a lot of contextual information there. I, I just like to provide that because there is a larger view out there as to what's happening beyond just the Bay Area and also beyond just the art sector. Um, and I like data, so. <laughs> Uh, and this is actually bringing it a little bit closer to home. Uh, this is the demographic profile of the five county Bay Area region. Uh, this is the counties that are considered just technically part of the, the Bay Area region, but there's also a seven county definition, there's a nine county definition, and an 11 county definition. But these are the ones that we typically look at. And you'll see actually that um, basically a little over a third of the residents of San Francisco County, that's basically the si synonymous with the city, are under 35. 
and um, about 33%, so about a third, are under 35 in Alameda County. So we're looking at, you know, again, the population here is a younger population in comparison with older, um, with the older their older counterparts and also other counties like Marin County um, and San Mateo is probably changing. This is from 2012. There is updated data um, also on the census that you can find on their website. So that's a little context. Um, now onto the research that I'm going to talk about. Uh, again, I'm, I'm probably speaking pretty quickly because I have about 15 minutes <laughs> to go through a lot of key points, but what I'm really going to be talking about is a 2009 study, as my um, title slide said, uh, that, um, that is called It's Not About You, It's About Them, Research Report on What Motivates Bay Area Donors. Uh, this was both a quantitative and a qualitative study that was actually done, uh, commissioned by the East Bay Community Foundation and the San Francisco Foundation in reference to a grant program that they did called Fund for Artists, which was focused on small to mid-sized arts organizations and individual artists that forced them to actually cultivate individual donors in a matching grant program. They could not go out and get corporate sponsors. They could not go out and get other foundation money. They had to actually interact with individuals, sometimes the artistic director picking up the phone and calling people. And um, so we actually, we did this study to understand why people gave to this program. What was different maybe about giving to this program than giving to other Bay Area arts organizations and uh, other organizations, maybe some of yours, actually participated in this study, which was very generous of them. Also to look at um, a segmentation model for donors based on their motivations, values, and attitudes, which I'll share with you, and to develop some tools for small groups and individual artists around fundraising to give some sort of strategy based on what we can learn around values to help them actually increase their connection and their potential with, um, with basically engaging individual donors. Uh, what did we do? Well, we did do interviewing, um, and there were case studies that were part of this report, but the bulk of what I'll be talking about actually is this pretty extensive quantitative survey that was sent to um, 500 donors from a sample of 500 donors each from 17 Bay Area arts organizations ranging in size and discipline, and 1,900 donors that participated in the Fund for Artists program. Uh, there were two data collection efforts. You know, I, I share the response rates to basically say that, granted, this was 2009, but paper surveying is still a viable method even in today's technologically savvy environment. Um, I do still see strong response rates through paper. That's just to tell you when you're gathering data, don't just discount it as an outdated mode. Um, we looked at a lot of data through these three analysis groups, Fund for Artist Donors, Donors to Mid-Sized Diverse uh, Contemporary Arts Groups, and Donors to Large Budget Organizations. I'll be showing you data by age. Um, there are limitations to this data, just so I'm going to talk a lot about generalizing, and that's what I'll be doing, but I, I just want you to know that although this may also look like your donors, and that's great, but you know there are unique aspects to your organization and your donor pool and your audiences um, that may not totally align with this. Um, as with any random sample, there is a margin of error for the overall sample. It's about plus or minus. 3%. The millennial sample, the under 35 sample, is relatively unstable. So I'm going to be showing you all of this, but again, you know, there is a margin of error here. And I just want to share that we have to be very upfront that things aren't concrete and there always is a margin of error. So, um, so take it as you will. But there's still value in looking at this, and the findings are still pretty robust. So um, with that, let's talk about what we learned. Um, Basically, uh, we asked a question, what causes do you support in general? And this was, uh, people were allowed to select multiple. And what did we find out in comparison between the younger respondents and the older respondents? Uh, those younger adults were more likely to be supportive of performing arts organizations, museums and fine arts groups, and social justice uh, and equality causes. In comparison with their older counterparts, political campaigns, international disaster relief, education, religious causes. So it's not necessarily to say that people, as they get older, right, start giving to these other things, but when we look at the younger generations, this is who they're giving to. Now, I will say also that the Fund for Artists group did have a lot more younger um, donors within its pool than some of the other groups, and that actually could be influencing it as well. So I do have to give that caveat. 
the theme I'm going to now really be focusing on is what really drives and motivates young people to give. And um, younger donors we found through this survey really want to make an impact. They want to actually not just have proof that what they're doing and what they're giving to um, is impactful, but they want to do it in their community. So this is basically a chart uh, that's answer to the question, in relation to your own giving to the arts, either in the past or the future, how likely are you to support the following? And you can see if you just follow the red diamonds, because that notifies the 18 to 34 year old cohort, up there at the top, um, it's rainbow colored, just in case you're wondering, from young to old, red to blue. Um, and if you follow the red dots, you can see smaller arts programs where my gift can make a difference is the um, top interest, followed by new work. So things that are living, that are relevant to me, that are cutting edge. Um, arts programs that aren't supported by other places, aren't likely to be supported by other places, individual artists, broad access, and then, and then long-term sustainability of an organization. But this focus on local, individual, new is a theme that we saw throughout the data. Uh, these are the bottom six interests by age, and what I want to point out here, which is a big difference, is that the last thing, actually for everyone, but really for young people, was nationally or internationally renowned artists. It's not that, you know, we don't care about quality, or I should say young adults don't care about quality, but it's not really driving them, you know, to bring this great artist in to the Bay Area um, or this, uh, you know, monograph kind of exhibition. It's really, again, things that are based in the personal and the local and that also appreciate and um, celebrate diverse cultures. Uh, one of the most um, valuable things that we did with the data was we took things like what I just showed you, these interests, and we took a range of different values. We asked people how important to you are the following, being on the leading edge of fine arts, um, having, um, being connected to my community, making new connections with friends, strengthening family connections, et cetera. And we put them all into this pod and we did something called a factor analysis, which is in technical terms, a data reduction technique. Um, which shows underlying dimensions uh, that drive basically the results. So it's essentially saying, okay, what are themes or categories that we can get from a stati statistical standpoint um, looking at this data? And what we found was that there were really five value and interest factors. This Venn diagram um, essentially shows the propensity of people within the sample that associate with that factor. So humanism, 82% of um, the respondents, that's the largest factor that's shared or that's common amongst all, this, all the respondents, followed by the distinction factor, localism, progressivism, and bonding, or bonding and then progressivism. The overlap is the extent to which, because this was essentially people could associate with multiple factors, essentially, or themes, it's the extent to which there's overlap between the two of them. So these uh, five, these five you can sort of see, I'm not going to spend too much time explaining them, but um, you see we put in actually in this Venn diagram little notes that relate to the variables that went into each factor. So right, localism, I just showed you a range of interests, so supporting individual artists, um, community-based projects, small group projects that again focus on the individual and the new, diversity, distinction certainly is about s supporting great works that stand the, stand the test of time, world-renowned artists, bonding is about family relationships, friends, progressivism is about cutting-edge arts, you know, supporting new work again, this individual rejecting authority kind of aspect of things, um, and humanism, social justice, alleviate suffering, et cetera. Um, for the rest of the presentation, this pink and yellow is going to actually be what we focus on. I'm just color coding it so that you can easily see and identify, especially by age, what is strong amongst the younger, um, the younger adults in this sample. So when we look at the association of the values uh, by age, again, if you look at the, this is um, basically, this chart shows the proportion of respondents within each age group that have a high pro propensity or a high association with these different value factors, these different themes. And again, when you look at the pink and the yellow, you can see certainly it's strong for the younger age cohorts overall, but in particularly for the 18 to 34 year old respondents, and in particularly that localism. So things that are close to me, that are relevant to me, that I can feel, that I can see, that I can taste, that I can touch in my community is what's important to me.
and also artists that I know, and um, that was something that was really um, evident in the rest of the data. Um, you can also see how that blue, the blue increases with age, which is the distinction factor. So older, basically older donors are really interested in bringing in those great artists. And some of that has to do, let's say, for example, with you know putting San Francisco on the map. There are people, for example, who support the symphony because the symphony puts San Francisco on the map and they really like that national, international reputation and that has to do with that diversity, excuse me, distinction value. Uh, you've heard me use the word personal a lot, and this is really important because um, personal connection is very key. And this is something, again, that's not, just, um, that's not just shown in the data in this 2009 study, but is also shown in subsequent studies that I've found online about millennial giving and values and motivations around giving, is that it, it needs to be personal one-on-one, -on -one or I need to know, this was this question. The question that um, this chart refers to is, suppose you are considering support, supporting an arts group that you have not previously supported financially. Which of the following conditions must be met before you would make a commitment, right? So what do you need? You haven't interacted with this organization yet, right? So I'm starting off cold here. Well, again, the top thing actually for both the under 35 and the over um, and the 35 plus is I need to know my gift will make an impact. So that's for everybody across the board. But then we start to see this split. I need to have attended their programs. I need to have a personal connection to the art form. And the biggest differences we see is I need to have a personal connection with one or more of the artists, right? So this connection with the art form, with the art, with the artist with people who support the program. And actually there was another question that I wanted to refer to, I don't have a chart, but the, qu the other question we asked about influence and how to actually, um, what influences you're giving is all else being equal, how likely are you, are each of the following approaches to gaining your support of the cause? And there was a range of different things, but the one um, that was most prominent um, and important for the younger adults was, a request from a friend, a family, a colleague to support this who is not affiliated with the organization, right? So it's a friend of mine who gives and it's important to them, right? It's this word of mouth, it's this peer networking, it's this peer sharing, and also that the connection is authentic. I don't have an ulterior motive because it's not for my organization, right? And there is something about that and authentic relationships are very important. Um, this was, the, I mentioned at the beginning, one of our goals for this study was to build a segmentation model to develop these typologies. The factors are one lens through which to look at our donors uh, and the values that they share. And another one was actually to do this uh, cluster analysis, which is taking a range of different things, values, interests, behaviors, things that drive giving, how much they volunteer, et cetera. And um, then really look at people through a um, mutually exclusive lens. So essentially what this model does is says, you are a values-driven intrinsic and nothing else, right? So you are squarely within that. Maybe you have some, some attributes that align with these others, but, um, but you can see, again, color coding <laughs> that essentially refers to, we like to kind of do that to draw the eye. Um, values driven intrinsic, you might imagine, right? These are the people who are really driven by being involved in a deep way, by local kinds of um, events and uh, exhibitions and activities, um, by individual artists, by new works, they're younger. Community altruists are older, they want to repay society for everything they've gotten out of it. Social justice is very important to them. Progressive artist champions, we, those are a lot of artists. They may give at lower levels, but they give, and they give more to the arts. They give all of their giving is primarily towards the arts. Um, High-touch social givers, these are the people who really want to sh schmooze, right? They're the ones who want to have the board members reach out to them. They like those donor events, which take them you know, behind the curtain and get them to meet with the artists and the board members. They like to be in the, the know. And um, social relationships are really important. Supportive audiences, and we were actually talking kind of a little bit about this uh, in the pre-panel discussion <laughs> um, that we were having um, before the beginning of this panel. These are the people who just have been giving because they just always give and they don't really, there isn't a whole, a whole lot that's driving them. These are members who've been members for a long time. Maybe you consider them part of your donor pool. They don't really have, you know, there isn't something that's really driving their behavior. They are older, so it's a habit. 
um, you know, and it is this the one of the smaller uh, proportions of this, but but they are, you know, nonetheless, they are there for you, um, and that's important to think about. Um, so what do we have here in terms of, again, where younger donors fit into the segmentation model? Um, Values-driven intrinsic and our progressive artist champions. Those are really the things that are driving them. They want to be involved in a deep way, deep engagement, and, um, and basically doing something new that's outside of the mainstream. Um, I will also say that's not exactly, I haven't talked about this, certainly the high-touch social givers really like a lot of connection, but um, values-driven intrinsic need, need a lot of, um, need a lot of, high touch beforehand, but not a lot once they commit to you. And that's actually something we've seen overall. There is a lot of work that has to be done co to communicate, but not necessarily once you get them into the fold, then they're just gonna be going along with you and for the ride, because they've already, you've already gained their trust. So what does this mean for arts groups? Strategy implications, I'll go through this really quickly. Um, uh, get to know your donors. Again, you don't need to be a researcher to do this, but you know it's not all about making the ask. It's just about asking them more about who they are and what's important to them. It's a larger conversation. Set aside some time and get to know them. That could be a party, one-on-one -on -one conversations. People really like that kind of personal connection. Um, diagnose your programming. This is a way of aligning your programming with thinking about values, values that might connect to your target segments. And this is just an example um, that's brought up that you could actually start to look beyond what is the artistic connection, but also how does it relate to social justice issue, women's issues, education, immigration, um, you know, equality, uh, diversity, and how does that speak to your target audience? How do you have a new conversation with them? Um, tailor your development approaches using value systems. Um, again, not just the ask, but there are a range of different ways of looking at that, and everybody relates in a different way, and you could actually tailor your messaging depending on their values. And uh, lastly, um, understand how much people want to be involved. And I mentioned, you know, some people really want to be involved at the beginning. Once you've got them hooked, they don't need anything. Some people, um, really need a lot throughout the whole thing, or actually need a lot of uh, con a confirmation and um, communication around the impact that their gift is making. Um, and just in summary, this, these are just a couple of bullet points that I leave you with, which is again, really focusing on values, less about the project and the product. It's, it's not that that's not important, and for some people that is, but for some people it's really what is the underlying meaning of what you're doing um, kind of to, um, to speaking about process rather than product. Um, and again, making those connections with value systems, prioritizing the personal, and following through. Um, and you know, the last thing going back to future proofing that I just wanted to go back to um, is uh, one of the questions that Jessica asked me to think about really is um, how will this audience change the way that the field operates? And what it, I think, means is that we're going to have to create more transparency. We're going to have to start to have real, tra authentic conversations with people. And um, we're going to have to not just um, expect, but actually ask for deeper engagement, because people want that. And I think that's what's going to happen. Um, and that's what we should allow them to do that, and we should invite them into that relationship. Um, and provide that ev evidence of impact. And it could be something just as simple as your gift went to X, attendance went up a certain amount, and you really helped us do that, right? So, um, so I think, again, the conversation is really what this population is gonna drive us to change. And um, that's all I have. Thank you for allowing me more time. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Barbara and Jessica, for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I was going to talk a little bit about uh, gift acceptance policies and sort of segue from that into the issue of divestment from fossil fuel, which uh, the Academy of Sciences has just undertook. So just uh, quickly, I'm curious, how many of you here know if your organization has a gift acceptance policy? 
see a few hands, good. How many know that you don't have one? So a few hands, and then how many of you aren't sure? Okay, well it's about equal all throughout the three. Okay, so, um, well just another curiosity, how many of you here have had to say no to a gift before? Yeah, a few hands. Okay, well, um, a gift acceptance policy is in some ways uh, you're backing to say no. Uh, there are occasionally times where a gift is not going to be appropriate for an organization. Um, and that can come up in a variety of ways. I have uh, attached here uh, the first page of the Academy's gift acceptance policy. And I have worked at a number of larger organizations, and each one I've worked at has had um, a gift acceptance policy, although I've not been as involved in sort of its contemplation and in this case revision as I have at the Academy. And so uh, I think we finalized uh, this newest version about four months ago and uh, it took about a year to do, uh, not because we were working so actively in that time, but there were just a lot of issues for us to sort of look into in more depth and sort of think about um, organizationally. And there were a lot of uh, people involved throughout the organization. And I think that's one of the most important things about a gift acceptance policy is that it sparks a conversation amongst uh, the, all the people in the organization who have sort of a vested interest. And that can be um, well, definitely the senior leadership, but uh, finance is always gonna be really interested in this conversation. Development, of course, is gonna be interested in this conversation. And, and then depending on the organization, um, how you break down into other departments and, and who those gifts are benefiting and, and what those conversations are like. Um, yeah, it, it's just gonna vary depending on the organization. And there are some really good examples of gift of acceptance policies out there. I'm gonna tongue twist on that, I'll, I'll talk, I think. <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, if you comb the internet, uh, Foundation Center, you'll find some out there and they provide a really good starting point for um, your own policy and, and starting your own conversation within your organization. So I think uh, with this Academy's um, guidelines, uh, in the second paragraph, it mentions the mission of the Academy to explore, explain, and sustain life. Um, but then it goes on to say that it's essential that contributions do not compromise or appear to compromise the integrity of the Academy's mission or its core business practices. So I think that is really the goal of this document is to iron out where those compromises might exist, create bright line rules where that's possible, and where it's not possible, create a process by which you review things at each point so that you understand um, what the interests are and you're always gonna have sort of um, difference of opinion amongst uh, the various departments. Um, finance I mentioned and some of you laughed because obviously fi finance is really interested in the bottom line and it's hard to say no to a gift in, at some instances. And then other times finance is maybe gonna be inclined to say no because it, it ties the organization a little too tightly. And so um, as a development officer, you have often different motivations. There might be a donor relationship that's really important to you and you really wanna preserve that relationship so that you um, are thinking of this gift maybe as a one in, in a spectrum or a trajectory of giving. And so to say no to a donor might upset that trajectory and so you wanna be really careful. Um, and so there are compromises in that respect that you need to be careful of, but there are also compromises in an organization that might be sort of more philosophical or even ethical and I think we'll get into that with the issue of divestment um, and that's a really um, sort of perfect place for the academy to have sort of put its mind to um, thinking about divestment from fossil fuels. And, and I guess I'll get to that sort of on the tail end of this, but um, uh, more immediately, it might be insightful to sort of talk about exactly what bright lines the academy's um, example of a, a gift acceptance policy sort of sets. So. The document is about 11 pages, and it basically has sections, as you see outlined. Each one of these gift types is a section, and so we go through and figure out um, what part of this gift or, or what problem gifts could exist in this arena, and how do we sort of negotiate those or deal with them. And it is actually kind of a nice crutch to say to a donor, we would love to take this gift from you, but our policy prevents it. And it, it sort of gives you 
um, an out where you might not otherwise have one. It doesn't put the blame on a person or a program or um, anything else. It allows you to sort of rely on this as a justification, which is kind of nice. Um, and just to sort of review some of these, obviously there are not too many problems with cash. That one was an easy one. <laughs> um, pledges, we wanted to think about what um, would constitute a pledge and, and if there are any time sort of restrictions we want to place on that and whether that needs to be in writing or not. Um, tangible personal property, the Academy gets quite a number of gifts and I personally work on a lot of gifts of tangible objects. Um, the Academy is a collecting institution and we have, I think, 46 million specimens at last count and people who collect often give us their scientific uh, specimens. We um, are uh, working really hard to acquire the largest private weevil collection in the world. <laughs> Weevils, if you're unaware, are these really tiny little beetles and uh, they're generally just considered as pests, but um, believe it or not, the millions of weevils that this couple of entomologists has is uh, something our entomology department has been kind of lusting over for some time. And so <laughs> we are really trying to uh, work with these donors who actually have other organizations, some around the Bay Area, looking to acquire this collection as well. So there's competition for these weevils. Anyhow. Um, then there are trickier widgets. There's the oil, gas, and mineral interests. There's things like bargain sales, uh, when we can accept a life insurance policy. And I won't get too into the weeds on those. Um, and then there's like the gift planning vehicles that I work with specifically, charitable gift annuities, charitable remainder trusts. Um, there are minimums and rules around when we can and cannot accept those uh, for charitable remainder trusts, uh, whether or not um, we have to be trustee in this situation. And, and then there's some easier ones down at the bottom, retirement plan and life insurance beneficiary designations. Those are sort of no-brainers and 90% uh, of what I do is actually bequests. But uh, bequests are an interesting one because somebody can give you anything by bequest and it's really hard to tell a person who's deceased no. But in fact, we've had to do it, and it's called uh, a disclaimer. And you basically say to the estate, we really appreciate this gift. However, um, it doesn't fit within our priorities, and we're going to have to disclaim it. And then depending on that person's estate sort of um, plan, they will maybe uh, distribute it out to a next of kin or somebody else. Um, but you have to be careful sometimes because, especially with gifts of tangible things and specimens, they might uh, set your direction more than you're comfortable with and, and allow or, or kind of tie your organization into a commitment to weebles maybe when you didn't want that. And so while we do, it's not always the case that every collection is something that we are going to want. Uh, and if it isn't something that you want, whether or not selling it is something that the donor would have been okay with. And, and that's a conversation you can't have after a donor's passed. And so what uh, my best advice would be is to have these conversations with donors before that point and, and understand what it is their intention is and whether or not what they're intending might be the best for the organization. And if not, maybe there's a, a better um, recipient. One other case that comes to mind is an individual who has a lovely piece of real estate near Santa Cruz. He wants to give it to the Academy as um, a research, a piece of land for research and for scientific investigation. Um, it's a very valuable piece of land, but the research value is actually minimal and there's nothing necessarily endemic or endangered on that land that would give our scientists any um, particular reason to be there. And so while we'd love to have that land in order to possibly sell it, this donor is under the impression that if we take it, we have to keep it forever. And so then it's a matter of management. There's costs to that. Um, there's liabilities associated with that. And so we want to be really careful about saying yes to a donor um, when there might be a much better use for this property elsewhere or in somebody else's hands. So i um, just going to look real quickly if I got through all the questions I wanted to. So that the process of sort of approving a gift acceptance policy was a good process for us to go through because it allowed um, some people who weren't quite aware of what a document like this might do to sort of come to understand it, um, come to see some of the issues that would arise and sort of think about the bright line rules that we might want to set. And then um, 
it also created a process by which we would be able to review things in the future that weren't perfectly contemplated by this document. And so on the next slide, uh, the gift acceptance uh, policy created the gift acceptance committee. And I know this the last thing anybody needs is another committee, but uh, this committee doesn't meet very often, but when it does, it's pretty brief. And uh, usually the, the answer is pretty clear. And, and what happens is our executive director, our chief development officer, a chairperson of the board, and uh, possibly senior members of the academy's management team, generally our CFO, get involved. And I might brief them as to the nature of a gift and they would then um, meet, discuss whether or not they felt like it really fit the priorities of the organization, and then um, I get the duty of either telling the donor yes or no. It's nicer when it turns out yes, but occasionally it's no. Um, so the other things that um, are sort of running conversation is right now we're in campaign mode where we want pledges in writing and fulfilled within five years, but that might change when we're outside campaign mode. And so this is sort of a living, breathing document. And um, while we considered it finished four months ago, I think even two weeks ago, there was another little change made. And so, I mean, that's good though, to keep things fresh and to keep your mind uh, sort of on what is and what isn't gonna work for you. Um, we also created a collections management policy, which more closely sort of monitors how we add to our scientific collections. And so it's sort of a corollary document and um, it's actually much longer than the 11 page gift acceptance policy, but it has to sort of deal with things like deaccessioning things and, and other sort of trickier issues um, in terms of maintaining the collections and management. And um, yeah, there's a whole host of issues that come up there. Um, I fortunately didn't have any um, duty to write any part of that one that was mostly left to scientists, so I don't have as much familiarity with it, but I knew that they do uh, sort of work hand in hand. Um, there are other issues, I won't go into all of them, but uh, uh, named and endowed fund guidelines, those seem to be issues that a lot of organizations have issues with or are sort of not clear on how much a donor needs to give in order to name something or to have sort of a, n a generally named fund or an endowed fund at the academy. We've set our endowed funds at a million dollars plus. And so um, unless a donor wants to invest in that, in that, at that threshold or beyond, um, it would generally go into general operating and not a perpetual fund. But uh, there are exceptions made from time to time and that also goes to the gift acceptance committee, but uh, some of those issues are also contemplated in a document like this. And then uh, we went on to ga uh, oil, gas, and mineral interests. And essentially those are sort of rights to the land of everything below the surface of the land. And, and so you might actually have people um, living on the land, but then the mineral interests are separate from that right to live on the land. and. Uh, they might be owned by two different people. So the Academy over the last 50 years has received a good number of gifts of this type and uh, essentially oil companies pay a lease to explore or to uh, mine or whatever else on the land. And uh, it has been recently determined that we're no longer interested in, in holding these types of interests. Our um, third mark of our, our mission is sustainability and we don't really want to be seen as complicit with oil and gas companies around the country. And so we have taken the step of um, selling these, these interests or returning them to the landholder um, or finding a way alternatively to maybe protect some of these places and maybe give them to land trusts or other things like that so that they won't be mined. But um, divestment is a bigger can of worms than that. So in sort of response to sort of thinking about divestment, our executive director who's about a year um, in at this point and, and has some really amazing ideas and has made some really remarkable changes. Um, he essentially said we're committed to ensuring that our investment strategy align with our commitment to sustainability. And we have already begun to phase out these interests and we have this policy and this was sent out to donors. Um, and we weren't sure what the response was going to be, um, but I actually polled some of the people that would have been the first line of response from donors and, and not one of them gave a, uh, 
a report of a negative sort of impression from this from this step and th and that was refreshing but we didn't know that there we didn't think that there would be but we just weren't sure and so we thought maybe we uh, would sort of talk about it and see but it's been really positively responded to um, we're at this point though where we still aren't perfectly out of fossil fuels in our endowment and the academy has an endowment of uh, I think it's about 165 million at this point and there are a lot of financial products that are make up that endowment and some of them the fossil fuel um, connection is pretty obvious but some of them it's not so obvious there's a lot of sort of what we're terming sort of indirect investments in fossil fuel and that's going to take us and the managers of our endowment a little bit longer to sort of iron out and figure out how we can fully divest from this. Um, but we were happy to see that, and, and in my sort of looking at the landscape, excuse me, of, um, of divestment, that we are noted on this site, uh, gofossilfree.org. And I just found this not too long ago, but I think it's actually put together by 350.org. They have chronicled organizations around the world, and they've noted it at 450, and they've actually broken it out into sort of sectors. Um, I found the sector breakdown pretty interesting. I wouldn't have expected faith-based organizations to be at the top of the list. I also didn't expect to see NGOs so low on the list, but I think it, it's still encouraging, and I wanted to see uh, what this 2.6 trillion really meant, and I circled sort of and read it. it says how is this number calculated well it doesn't tell you exactly how they calculated what I think that number represents because um, that's a very large number actually uh, is the number of assets um, that these 450 organizations have in total and so you can be sure that within that 2.6 trillion that there's no investments in fossil fuels but I don't think it's actually the number of dollars taken out of fossil fuel investments but um, what I uh, found by clicking on that number, or that, that circled area, was sort of the breakdown of the ways in which the site categorizes divestment. And at the top of the list is fossil free, which is what the Academy is striving to be right now. Uh, but it's gonna take a little time for us to, to fully divest and be what they consider fossil free. What the Academy is at this point is full, which is about a, um, a full commitment essentially um, to being fossil free and a lot of the organizations fall in that in that camp as well out of that 450 but then you have further um, differentiation at partial at coal and tar sands and coal only um, generally as far as the landscape's concerned you know this still is going to be in some ways a drop in the bucket for oil companies um, but I don't think it's so much about that um, and, you know, if every, um, or if the top 500 universities in the country were to divest, um, there would be a big impact. That would be about 400 billion in divestment from fossil fuels. And I think they would take notice at that point. And other people might take notice too, thinking maybe oil isn't such a great investment if it's just susceptible to maybe the will of the people, which we're hoping as an institution representing sustainability, we can help influence as well. And so I think, um, the saying a death by a thousand cuts maybe you know we can each be a cut and uh, put fossil fuel um, companies success uh, a little behind so I thank you all very much for your time and if you want to uh, that's my email if you want to reach out with any further questions thanks Afternoon. Um, Jerry Bloomgarden with the East Bay Community Foundation, and I want to talk about Giving Days. Um, so, East Bay Community Foundation. I've been there for about three years after coming out of uh, the Clorox company for 18 years, having a number of different roles, none of them having to do with um, nonprofit or community relations <laughs> or anything like that. And so uh, I work in donor services. And one of the great things about the East Bay Community Foundation is that it's been around for 87 years. But when you think of 87 years, you can think of Betty White 87 years, like isn't she the coolest, like hippest 80, 92 I believe is how old she is. Or you can think of like 
87 years, wah, 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 like, oh my gosh, get out of the basement. And so not long after I'd gotten to the uh, Community Foundation, we were trying to re-energize development because we have um, a heavy core group of fabulous, wonderful, interesting Betty White-like donors, but we really skew older. And so when you think about financial stability, you think, well, how are we going to continue this flow? How are we going to keep our pipeline full? So we had just hired a new director of development, and um, Kimbia came knocking at our door talking about giving days. And in our paradigm, it was like, we don't do, no, no, we don't do giving days. We don't do that. It's too hard. Too many people, too much money. No, 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 we don't do it. And so the development director said, well, how can we shift our paradigm if we're not willing to like step out and try something new? So uh, Kimbia said, we'll give you all the software and, and you guys can do it for free because this year we don't have anybody in the Bay Area. Silicon Valley uses Razoo. We have nobody in the Bay Area that's gonna participate and give Local America and it's the 100th anniversary of Community Foundations we'll give it to you for free. And so we signed up. That was probably in September or October of 2013. We had one kickoff meeting where they brought some department heads together and they said, we're gonna do this giving day and I'll talk to you more about it in January. It'll be in May. And we're like, Psh, whatever. And so then we had um, some illness with staff. Everybody kind of forgot about it. And in January, it's like, oh wait, we're getting all these emails from Kimbia in this uh, person who's out on disabilities mailbox. And so the COO came to me and said like, well, how about donor services doing this giving day? And so me and my nonprofit infancy, I was like, sure, I'll do that. Yeah, no problem. We had no funding, no staff, no nobody to do this. And so I grabbed one of my staff members like, oh, you and I can do it and we'll just work on it in our spare time. It'll be really fun. We got this playbook and we started walking through this wonderful Kimbia document that tells you exactly what to do, but we had no scope of how to do it or what to do with it. And so at the end of May, I wanna say May 3rd or May 4th, it's always the first Tuesday, Give Local America is always the first Tuesday in May, we had registered, I don't know, 140 um, nonprofits and we raised about $206,000 in 24 hours. And we just thought like, oh my God, we are the coolest people ever. And we started looking through all the community foundations like $11 million, $5 million. And we were like, okay, well, we still feel good. That was our first year. And so we battled to get it funded for 2015 because the foundation was like, well, well it took a lot of time. And we were real proud that we had like scribble scrabbled together $13,000 for prizes, but we really went hard. We got the foundation to fund it and we set goals and objectives, which we didn't have the first year. And so uh, we did that and we decided how many donors we wanted. We decided how many nonprofits we wanted to um, register. We decided how many, how much money we were going to earn and at the beginning of every meeting, we said, okay, what are our goals and intentions? And we invited everybody that worked at the foundation, all 23 people to participate and still ended up just two. And then we got another person. So it just ended up three of us. And at the end of May 5th, we had earned um, $649,000 in 24 hours. So essentially triple it with 300 plus nonprofits. And so, um, and we gave, we ended up with $100,000 in prizes for everybody. And so we were really, really psyched about it and we're full charge for next year. And so when you think about financial stability and a giving day, the thing is, is it provides financial st stability for the participating nonprofits as well as the hosting organization. And so, East Bay Community Foundation, we started it as a development project. 
I'm not from development, nor did I know much about development. So my lens was always towards the nonprofit. And part of our mission is to support nonprofits in our region, Contra Costa and Alameda County. I think it's about 6.6 million people. And as well, we have people from San Francisco, San Jose, Marin, um, Sacramento, and we full, we didn't close the doors. We wanted it to be as inclusive as possible. And so um, we changed our strategy and, and ended up with this wonderful program. Is this somebody's Samsung thing? Okay, I'll take care of it for you. And so um, when you think about financial stability, so our development group's point of view was we've got to create a pipeline. So just like your own um, finances in your own personal lives, you may want to create multiple streams of income. You may want to um, divest or be very diverse in how you invest. But what uh, a giving day has done for the participating nonprofits and the East Bay Community Foundation is it's opened us up to this um, when you look at the number of donors, I'll show you some statistics in a little bit, but when you look at the number of donors um, from year to year and that we capture all of that information and, it, and we also capture it for all of the nonprofits, they each get a report, um, the possibilities are endless because you also, um, we, you can also devise ways to get particular information. So last year, one of the prizes was whichever organization that's registered gets their board to, everybody on their board to make a donation, you know, between 3 a.m. and 4 a.m. in the morning. Like they won the cash prize for that hour, might have been $1,500 or $2,000 or $5,000. But in essence, we ended up capturing all the board information. <laughs> and so, um, the other thing that's really important is all the sharing that we do with social media. So everybody that registers likes everybody that registers. And so there's this huge amplification of people. So the first year, um, what that looks like is we're sitting in our war room that we created, like all two of us, with our you know bag of apples. And we're just watching all this money, our $200,000 flow in, and we're just like, yay. And I get a telephone call from one of our donors. And she said, I knew I wanted to donate to um, organization XYZ because they have a match matching grant. So the organizations go out and tell everybody that they're participating and ask for matching grants. And she said, but um, while I was looking through the website, I was looking at some of the other organizations and I found these three that looked really interesting to me. So I clicked through to their web page, I read their little blurb, I looked at their photograph, and I'm thinking I'm gonna make some donations to them too, what do you think? And I'm like, I think that's great. So she said, well, this one, XYZ organization, what do you think about $10,000? Do, do you think that's a good donation? <laughs> I'm like, uh, yes, I think that's fine. And I'm like kicking my feet and waving my hands underneath the table. Um, and then she gave $10,000 to another organization and $5,000 to the third organization. And so now they just gained this donor that was really, it's an EBCF fund holder. And so we have all kinds of stories about people looking at the website or people you know, looking at on our Facebook page and seeing all this information about all of these other organizations. And so um, we've been able to shepherd all of the nonprofits, which again is part of our main mission as a foundation. And um, some of the organizations have opened agency funds at the foundation, which is part of our mission. And so um, it's really been a win-win. And so uh, what Jessica asked us to talk about were um, successes, and so obviously tripling the money that we earned was a huge success. But I think from year one to year two, we just kind of felt our way through in year one, but establishing our goals and objectives, like saying we are going to earn, our goal was to earn $500,000. And so we exceeded that, but you know, every time we talked about it, like, yeah, we're gonna get 500, yeah, we're definitely gonna get 500,000. And then leadership buy-in. So we thought of some things, in, and so the success factors, I'm really attributing those to 2015. Um, 
So to get leadership buy-in, because our organization is small, lots of times, or historically, we've always made a decisions by consensus, which is a nice idea, but it can also be really crippling because you can't move. You can't make a decision and move forward. And so we laid out this really nice document that said, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. These are the people that are going to do it. And we got them to buy in early so we didn't constantly have to go back and you know get permission. And then the other thing was um, to show up in the community. So our community is huge. I mean, if you think all the way down to Fremont and all the way out to Antioch and then, you know, back to Oakland, Berkeley, Pleasanton, Livermore. Um, but we showed up in the community and had um, live webinars. And then we showed back up at the East Bay Community Foundation, which has a beautiful conference center attached to it. And um, we hosted registration, like you could come and register that day. And then we had days where people could come if they didn't have a Facebook page. You know, come and watch, bring your laptop if you can, and we'll all set them up at the same time. And so the nonprofits really knew that we were there for them 100%. We were on the phone all the time. Um, and it was really, it was really fun. And then um, our intention and expectation of fun and success. So we knew what I always said to my team of two was we have the goals. We're not ever going to back off the goal. goal. We can exceed the goal, but we can't um, fall under the goal. And we didn't. We exceeded everything. And so um, just so that you can see, I think, you know, I've already spoken about the, come on. All right. So the total donations, 200 thousand and six hundred and forty the total nonprofits um, 138 versus 360 um, so there's donations dollars and donations actual people who made donations 864 versus 4019 so that's how many people actually went through the site and then um, the prize pool the first year <laughs> we got one cash donation from uh, one of our supporting organizations and then I think that was like 2500 and then the rest of was like we gave away space and time in our conference center <laughs> I mean but it's what we had you know when you look at Silicon Valley they have really robust relationships with um, like Microsoft because they give away computers and pads and everything we gave we gave away conference room time which I like um, so those were our results and then challenges, um, organization, oh, you can read that. Okay, organizational engagement. So we've, we, you know, everybody's always, I'm so busy, I'm so busy, I can't help. And so we're fine with our team of three. We really love to do this work and um, that's fine. But uh, I always think like so many brains are better than three. So it'd be interesting to have input from more from program and from development. And we don't really have that, but we're still successful. And then prize sponsorships. We spent invested a lot of time going to corporations, thinking that they would um, invest and give us prize money. And they a lot of the corporations they will give you volunteer hours, but they won't give you money. Um, and so what I learned was that that doesn't really happen. And we ended up looking at everybody, like some of the more successful community foundations, and um, they generally put the money in themselves out of their endowment. So this year, I won't work so hard on that. I'll just ask for it from our endowment. And then the comprehension of the event by nonprofit. So some people think like you just sign up and then you magically get this check. So we're constantly engaging with them. Um, we write Facebook and Twitter posts and push them out to all of the um, nonprofits. We, again, have people in if they're not technically savvy um, and create Facebook pages and, and such for them. And um, so constantly trying to get them to engage with their donors and be creative about it and use social media because social media is really the um, key to that success. Uh, but th so that's about giving days. If you have any questions, of course, you can ask us. Um, and it's really fun. I'm all about fun. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. Oh, there's your husband's line. Uh, well, thank you to Jeff and Barbara for inviting me to speak today. Um, you have great timing. This is literally the last hours of our crowdfunding campaign. So I'm happy, well, I'll be happy to report how we're doing at the end of it. I'll leave you guys in suspense for a little bit. Um, so again, my name is Elizabeth Miner. I'm a development associate at the Hearst Museum of Anthropology and come from an archeology span background. Um, so it's not complete coincidence that we chose to do an Egyptian-themed crowdfunding campaign. Where should we put this one? Over there. The Hearst Museum of Anthropology has 3.8 million objects in our collection, but not all of them can be on display. The majority of our collections are in storage and off-site facilities. We have one really exciting object that we want to bring to you as part of the lobby display of our newly reopened gallery in 2016. We like to call him the doctor. Hi, I'm Dr. Elizabeth Miner, and I'm an Egyptologist here at the Hearst Museum. I'm really excited to show this coffin lid to you today. It's two and a half thousand years old. It belonged to a man named Samsik, who was a doctor in ancient Egypt. And you can see now it's off-site, so we want to bring it to the lobby to be the star of the show and welcoming you to the new renovated gallery. The challenge is that it weighs 7,000 pounds, but we're really excited and we hope that you're able to share our project and bring part of the treasures of the museum to everybody. Thank you. A dollar a day keeps the doctor okay. Hi, I'm Dave Tozer. I'm head of development at the Hearst Museum. And with our gallery renovation at Crowbar Hall, the Hearst Museum is pivoting from safeguarding to also showcasing our global collection of objects. Our 2016 exhibition will highlight the depth and breadth of our amazing, important research and teaching collections. And we hope you will support our dream to put the doctor front and center for many people to be wowed for many years to come. Thank you. As you can see, crowdfunding is a, a great way to um, tap into the energy of your organization, a museum in this case. Um, we kind of fell into this cohort of crowdfunding projects that Berkeley is sponsoring. It's the second time that they've done this. Um, so there are a few, uh, I was asked to speak about successes and um, ideas for changes for the future, and there's definitely many that we encountered because this is only, again, the second time that Berkeley's rolled out a crowdfunding um, kind of uniform campaign. Many departments were starting to turn to it on their own to fund projects, and um, Berkeley's very concerned in general with having a cohesive um, kind of marketing presence uh, all throughout the university. And so they've worked with a site called Scale Funder that is our platform. And you can see there's a big diversity in projects that we were, were kind of rolled out with. We were the first arts and humanities project, um, and I'm happy to say that we were very successful, but other ones, let's see if I can bring a pointer up. Other ones include um, development projects in other countries, um, such as like health initiatives, and also local entrepreneur. Um, there's a makerspace one that one that did very, very well. Um, we always set our goal, our main competition, <laughs> we're up against the cheerleading squad, the UC Berkeley ch cheerleading squad. Um, so we're like, okay, if they're going to get funded, we're going to get fully funded too. Um, let's see, sorry. The video playing kind of for me for a loop. <laughs> right, so there are many um, other platforms that you can use, for example, Kickstarter. It is an all or none model. So if your project doesn't reach its funding goal, you don't receive the funding. Um, Indiegogo, however, is similar to ours, where even if the full goal wasn't reached, then you get the, the donations that you've received. They all take different percentages. 
Um, in our case, the UC system takes 3% and about 2% goes to credit card companies. Um, compared to, say, grant writing at Berkeley, where the overhead is something like 54% currently, you can see we're getting a really great return on our, on our money or our efforts. Um, there was also about a two-month planning phase that we went through for this project. So there was a lot of investment ahead of time. Um, and it was, again, very structured by UC Berkeley because they want a cohesive message to come out. Um, and so especially if you're working with an institution that's larger and might have concurrent um, projects, I'm sure that they'll be interested in kind of giving that structure. There is definitely a move towards crowdfunding in museums and some rather quite uh, high level institutions are using them. For example, the Louvre um, has, I think this is the third or fourth crowdfunding campaign that they've done to obtain objects that they're interested in using kind of the the idea that it's cultural patrimony, that the people of France are giving money in order to obtain and have it be part of their museum. So they're kind of tapping into this sort of natu nationalistic uh, feeling. Um, and then very recently, the Smithsonian started the Reboot the Suit campaign to um, conserve and 3D model Neil Armstrong's space suit for an upcoming exhibit. And that was also widely successful. Let's see, it's they were going for uh, 500,000 and they made over 700,000. Um, we were very excited to watch that. It was starting and um, it didn't end until ours was underway. So we were kind of curious to see, I mean, their goal was much higher than ours. But we wanted to see how it came out. Um, so for our campaign, we had success in reaching our fundraising goal. Um, but there was a challenge also of setting an appropriate amount. It was actually quite structured by UC Berkeley also. Um, they want to see $10,000 um, um, plus whatever seed gifts you can obtain. Um, we kind of went rogue. They let us <laughs> set a higher goal because um, there's, they're doing a lot of student groups, student-run groups that maybe don't already have a donor base like we do. So they let us set a $20,000 goal with only probably a, a $5,000 seed gift. Um, so we were very nervous to see if we would make it, but we wanted to set the highest goal possible that we thought we could reach because, again, we want to um, create a lot of momentum in our museum as we plan to reopen in, um, in fall of 2016. Um, also, seed gifts at the start are very important to have the sort of money in the tip jar effect. Um, when people have the site go live and start being broadcast widely, if there's already support shown, um, it gives you a head start and, and people are more likely to give. The psychology of crowdfunding is very interesting. You want to seem exciting and relevant and, and well supported. Um, so I guess a tip also for anyone else considering crowdfunding is to try to find a concrete and bounded project in our case, it's a very personified project. It's an object. It's even in the shape of a person, so it's very easy to relate to. Um, and it has a narrative to it. It's an object that's off-site. It hasn't been seen. It's going to be brought to the public. Um, it's kind of wraps together nicely in a narrative. In the long run, this is going to form the basis for our entire new lobby in, during the renovation. So there's a story to it, but we get a, a distinct benefit out of it. Um, it's also just very compelling visual content. It's large and interesting and, and beautiful. It is truly really kind of the star of the collection. Um, one of the other successes that we had is in building community interest in our reopening, but there was a large challenge in our marketing campaign. So we used both email marketing and social media marketing. Um, so in our case, we had a mailing list of oh, just over 5,000 people already. Um, and you can see that with 5,000 people, we got 55 clicks <laughs> and out of that um, donations. And again, as donations are still hopefully coming in as I'm speaking, I haven't run all of the percentages yet, uh, but it looks like in general about a third of our donations came directly from these, e these emails, this constant contact campaign that we did. Um, we didn't want to overwhelm our existing donors or people who already had a connection with us, so we sent out an announcement at the beginning. It was a total of a four-week campaign, so announcement at the start, 
with one week left, and then I'm going to send out a very happy email with one day left tomorrow morning saying that we've achieved our, our goals. Uh, we also did an aggressive social media marketing campaign, um, which I truly enjoyed. Um, it was my favorite part of it. And so you can see this is the um, page and tab visits over the course of the month. So this is the day that we went live um, with little peaks over time. And then <laughs> this huge bump at the end, which we had some well-timed events and announcements that I can discuss in a second. Um, I don't know if any of you are involved in social media outreach or marketing through your museums, but Facebook is very um, persnickety as to what it kind of sends out into your followers' news feeds. So we, I did a fairly um, well uh, like thought out or intentional increase in our posts just leading up to this campaign. So it's, it's definitely a snowball effect as it takes the time, oh, you can have as high of a quality post and post it when you're not showing up as much. And then as your momentum builds and more people have liked it, Facebook decides that you, you are interesting. We are going to share you with your audience and, and send it out more, um, which is very frustrating. We actually never paid to boost a post. That's another thing that you can do. Um, but we, we decided not to kind of fall into Facebook's traps and, and, and do that. But it is a possibility. Uh, what's great about using the email marketing and the social media marketing is that we've, we've boosted our, and expanded our interest base a lot, and we've also gotten a lot of metrics off of it. Um, so for example, these are the metrics of that month of engagement on uh, Facebook. Um, so the gray is our fan base, and then the blue are the people that were engaged during that month. So you can see that we um, <laughs> we actually, it's, you're just talking about millennials, we actually ended up reaching out into the, an older age bracket more than we usually do um, in, in both men and women. The regional one is interesting too. You can see we have some kind of strange hotspots showing up, cities. Okay, Berkeley, that makes sense. We're a museum in Berkeley. Um, Italy. <laughs> well, our, our new faculty curator of Egyptian archaeology is from that part of Italy. So that was... Uh, that was that. Billings, Montana. <laughs> uh, we have a newly announced acting director, and he's from Montana. <laughs> Cairo, I'm especially happy about. Um, that shows that uh, uh, even our international audience, people that are connected to the material that we are sharing, got involved. Um, so I'm happy to see that. Um, so this is great. With the success, it demonstrates a community backing for our reopening and a popular interest in our collection. And our donors range um, from directly connected through UC Berkeley, especially faculty, associated professionals, and students. And then also with the social media outreach, we've identified potential new members or new membership bases. And then we can, the tip is with your crowdfunding Okay, so you, you raise money, but you also get a lot of information that you can mine, and also testimony for collateral for later use. Um, when people make a donation, they can put down why they, like a note as to why they're donating. Um, so we were successful in creating marketing materials and media, but there was a big challenge in the technical side. Um, you need very media savvy people in order to do um, this full range of, of press releases, social media marketing videos. Um, we are a quite small museum, so that technical <laughs> team was myself. Um, but luckily, I had a, a experience with video production. Um, it should be very cohesive also, that you want to make sure that all of the avenues have um, a general same look to it and the same tone. And again, I'm excited and, and kind of fun tone, which is one of the great things about, about crowdfunding. It's, it's kind of playful at the same time. Um, it's a chance for not just a simple or boring 2D representation of the museum, and a chance for self-representation. Again, this, this inherent high energy and less formal medium. Um, we were able to um, use several events and um, kind of bits of content that happened at the same time. Um, some intentional, some just kind of quite lucky timing. Um, we used earlier images and material about the doctor, and you might recognize actually Jessica Horowitz, thank you for being our, our model um, for this members event, uh, viewing it. Uh, we, the Egyptian collection happens to be a fairly high use part of our collection, so we had um, kind of site visits, 
two, uh, two researchers here and another researcher came during that time, so we were able to highlight them. Um, and class visits, uh, here you can see um, an Egyptologist using part of the collection for teaching her course. So we're able to demonstrate why people should be giving to support this part of our collection. And the most fortuitous timing was our um, announcement of our new acting director, Dr. Benjamin Porter, um, which definitely drove people to uh, our sites. So it went out on Facebook, it was shared a lot, um, and, and people kind of followed up by looking at our crowdfunding campaign. So when you're undertaking one of these campaigns, if you are able to stage it with these events or announcements in mind. Um, one of the kind of trickier parts of doing crowdfunding is also offering perks that go at, at different levels of donations. And in our particular situation, we could only do non-monetary perks um, because of the way that UC Berkeley is, is set up um, and sort of the nonprofit status of the crowdfunding component. So we had to get creative, um, and they're all vetted by Berkeley and, and approved. So there's a lot of digital things that we're offering. Um, the <laughs> one that I came up with just this week, um, I wanted to kind of do a mop up of people that were interested, but maybe didn't want, uh, there was some sort of barrier for them giving even at a $15 level. So it was for $5, you get like a digital bumper sticker saying that you, you heart the host, but in hieroglyphs. One person has claimed it. <laughs> So that was not a success. Um, the $15 social media thank you was, was very popular. So that was something that's kind of at, at a very entry level and it's simple, it's simple for us to, um, to give to them. It's just listed on our Facebook page. Um, digital poster and we're also 3D modeling the doctor while it's mo being moved. And so I said that at $500 and several, let's see, I think eight people have claimed it. Um, the thing that was the most popular is getting your name on the Hearst Museum Gallery donor wall. And I'm very happy to report that it, it, it was very popular. People want their support to be acknowledged. Um, and yeah, we set that at $100, which was a good choice. Um, I also tried to build in perks that gave back to us as a museum. So for example, for $50, you get an invitation to preview day. So this is great. People are excited to be able to give money, be able to get in early and, and get um, a preview look at the gallery reopening in probably fall of 2016. Um, but then we get an audience that's already, we know it's excited, they want to come, they're actually, um, they're already engaged in it. Um, and so we'll be able to get feedback from them. Uh, that one was, was also quite successful. Um, and yeah, and then at $1,000 is a director-led tour. And actually, I think, I think I might have taken this screenshot earlier, but I believe we have five five people that um, are going to get that perk. Uh, so again, a tip would be, you know, make sure that you um, kind of vet them with your institution and see if they um, kind of complicate your nonprofit status in our case. Uh, and then also see ones that can kind of loop back if that will ultimately help you um, maybe get input back from an audience that's already bought in. Um, we also had a lot of success in bringing in unique donors. Right now it looks like about uh, two thirds of the donor base, um, but we did have the challenge of finding those unique donors and, and mining our personal contacts also. Um, we had great success. This is uh, um, Rita Lucarelli, who's uh, now the faculty curator of Egyptian archeology span at the museum. And she was very great at being a spokesperson, bringing in her network, as you saw, were very popular in Italy. Um, and then also sharing, she had a big following of students and, and other professionals. Um, so it's good to identify people who have that multiplier effect and can and share along your message and bring in new people. And what's exciting too, is that there's going to be a lasting impact on our outreach because um, I believe our likes went up by 10%, uh, maybe 15%. So now these are new people that are excited about a reopening, interested in the collection, and in the coming months we can, um, we can, we have this great new base to, to engage with as a museum. And then we'll be excited to come to the reopening and see the objects that they, they're already familiar with. Um, I guess the tip for that kind of 
multiplying effect and finding unique donors is to space out your asks and to release with new content. So I tried to never make that same image um, show up, even though we were, I was always linking back to the same donation page, I bundled it with some sort of new content so people wouldn't get tired of seeing the same ask over and over again, even though it was essentially the same. Um, and as far as I can tell, we had very few unlikes and very few hides also, um, so people weren't getting tired of us, even though we were, it was probably a post every, every other day um, about the project. And no one ever said, we're tired of Egypt, we want to see more about blank part of the world, so I was happy about that too. Um, so here's the big reveal. Today we're up to, um, so our goal was uh, $20,000, and so now we're up to $23,095. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> it was down to the wire this morning. Um, so I guess the big question though, and in terms of sustainability, is how sustainable is crowdfunding? Could we do a project like this once a year um, for a new object each time? Um, we're, we're debating that, and as we're, part of UC Berkeley's crowdfunding, we have to kind of work within their model, and so we don't know if they would let us do another one again. We haven't started that conversation yet, um, but we were very successful. We were, I think, by far the most successful of the cohort at the moment. Again, it's closing out tomorrow, so we're not quite sure who has large gifts processing, et cetera. Um, we raised more money than the cheerleaders. <laughs> Yay. But we, um, it, is, it was interesting kind of cohort building for all of the projects that were happening. And so in fact, the cheerleader um, manager of their project, he was so excited about this one that uh, we have a verbal agreement that when the doctor comes, the cheerleaders will come do a cheer for us. <laughs> so a lot of um, bridges being built. Um, and, and again, I'm happy to answer any questions about um, just from the technical side through, through the planning of it. So thank you.